Well, good evening. How are you doing? It's uh, just gone nine o'clock in Port Stewart, Northern Ireland. And while I'm staying at home, I'm reading from uh, Paperboy every evening. I hope it's a, a bit of a Belfast bedtime story for you. Maybe bring you a little bit of nostalgia from wherever the world you're watching and uh, bring back some memories of 1970s Belfast. And um, I'm up to chapter 17 tonight. So um, this is an interesting chapter. It's all about the legendary Bay City Rollers concert at the Ulster Hall. Yes, do you remember them? Bay City Rollers. Well, that's what this, concert, this uh, chapter is all about. So I hope you enjoy this. It's chapter 17 of Paperboy, and it's entitled Musical Distractions. B-A-Y, B-A-Y, B-A-Y-C-I-T-Y with an R-O-L-L-E-R-S. Bay City Rollers are the best. Our day had come, so it had. We were a gaggle of excited teenagers in high-waisted parallel trousers assembled at our neighbourhood bus stop at the top of the shankle. Together, we were waiting for a black taxi to take us down the road into the much-abused city centre so as to see the Bay City Rollers in concert in the Ulster Hall. Bedecked in tartan from the berries on our head to the Dr. Martins on our toes, we were chanting Rollers classics non-stop. It was unreal, like a dream come true. In the excitement of getting all our tartan regalia in place, we had missed the bus into town and the next one wasn't due for ages, if it wasn't hijacked in the meantime. As the only pacifist paper boy in West Belfast, I had certain moral difficulties with using an illegal black taxi instead of the bus because the taxi money would go to the paramilitaries. But this was an emergency. I justified my actions on this occasion with the thought that once the taxi driver had taken out a percentage for petrol and cigarettes from my 10p fare, there probably wouldn't be enough left to buy a whole bomb. I had waited for this day for months and nothing, not even being a blessed peacemaker, was going to stop me from getting to the Ulster Hall in time to see the Scottish superstars perform their greatest hits right there in front of me. I have to admit, I had rushed my paper round that day. I had been careless with too many gates and had leapt over a number of fences and hedges that were not approved for jumping. Even the fear of disciplinary procedure for my Mac could not hold me back on this occasion. Every second was vital, and so I had to cut corners. I had intentionally skipped the final crucial stage of fully pushing the newspapers into expectant homes. Half the houses on the streets had newspapers hanging out of their letter boxes. The semi-posted Belfast telegraphs looked all droopy and forlorn, like Petra's tail when she ran away up the street after you kicked her for trying to have sex with your leg like a boy dog. All the gang was there. My big brother was the leader of the pack in black parallels and with only a subtle hint of tartan in the lining of his black Harrington jacket. He was a fan, but he was determined not to express too much adoration of the rollers in case it made him sound homo. And he was careful not to overdo it with the tartan accessories. If any of us got too enthusiastic, he would command us, command us to, Why is that bap? And we would dutifully obey. If my big brother was the godfather of the gang, then Heather Mateer was the godmother. Heather was the most mature. She was 16 with breasts and leaving school soon. She had feathered hair, done it his and hers beside the Shankle graveyard, and she was wearing a long tweed coat over her white parallels with a tartan stripe up the side. The same ones that had ripped at Caramela and which her ma had sewn back together again. Heather was wearing the tweed coat just in case she got overexcited because she knew if her parallels split again and we saw her knickers once more, we would laugh our heads off and she would be scundered in front of the whole of the Ulster Hall. She was also sporting five tartan scarves tied together, which she had wrapped around her neck and flung over her shoulder. She looked like a tartan girl, Doctor Who. Heather had a bad Belfast habit of starting every sentence with the word like for no apparent reason. Like, when's this bloody taxi coming? 
she asked. Like, I hope my ma sew these parallels tight enough, she fretted. To see that lovely lace bacon in the flesh, she drooled. Most of us talk this way at times, but Heather did it in every sentence. I knew that fewer people at Belfast Royal Academy began their sentences with like, so to fit in there, I had to reduce my uses of the word. Like, I didn't want to sound like I was from up the shankle or anything. Heather Mateer's best friend, Lynn McQuiston, with the buck teeth, was there too. Lynn was the biggest Bay City Rollers fan in the world. She had all their singles and her bedroom wall was covered with so many Rollers posters that you couldn't even see the wood chip. Lynn was obsessed with the lead singer, Les McCune. I just love Les, so I do. She kept repeating as she gazed at a card with a picture of her idol, which she got free from a bubblegum pack. Lynn knew his birthday and his height and the colour of his eyes and his favourite animal and everything. She wanted us to go straight to the stage door at the back of the Ulster Hall, where she dreamed she would meet Les and their relationship would begin. They would get married and she would go on tour with him if he didn't want to come and live in the shankle because of the troubles and all. At least Lynn had thought things through. Titch McCracken was there at the bus stop too, of course. He was wearing an old pair of white parallels almost up to his knees, which he'd clearly grown out of, even though he hadn't grown very much at all. I thought they looked disturbingly tight around the region of his Jimmy Joe. Like, them trousers must be cutting the welly off you, wee lad, said Heather Mateer sympathetically. Heather had a beautiful way with words. Titch's mother must have put the said trousers in the wash with his purple jumper because they were also slightly pink. What are you doing in pink parallels, you wee fruit? My big brother felt compelled to ask. Titch also, Titch also had a tartan scarf attached to his wrist, but as he tied it round his smoking hand, he kept getting ash on his tartan, leading me to fear that his scarf would meet the same sad fate as his cindered paper bag in the telephone box. He was sharing drags of his cigarettes with Philip Ferris, who didn't deserve to be there at all, in my view. He had made no effort whatsoever. There was not as much as a splash of tartan on the brown duffel coat he was wearing. Even I knew a duffel coat was not appropriate attire for a rock concert. Philip was more interested in playing five-a-side football with the boys' brigade than anything remotely musical. Like, could you not have borrowed a tartan scarf in the night? inquired Heather Mateer. Bay said he bollocks, Philip grunted in response. Ari Maxwell was there too, smothered in every tartan accessory she had ever seen in Jackie magazine. This included a denim and tartan Donny Osmond style beret, purple parallels with tartan stripes and tartan waistband and tartan pocket flaps and tartan turnips, as well as tartan scarves, scarves attached to most of her limbs. Aaron was also wearing an Eric Faulkner t-shirt and a host of badges proclaiming, I love Eric. Her brazen infidelity to David Cassidy that day was shocking. I wonder if Big John will be there the night, she asked irritatingly. He liked the Bay City Rollers before he moved to Bangor, and he was lovely, so he was, and he looked like David Cassidy, so he did, she gushed. I had to tune her out, or she would potentially spoil the whole evening. The presence of Sharon Burgess, however, ensured the evening could not be spoiled. She wore a brown tank top over a brown blouse with a big round brown collar and brown parallels with a tartan stripe down the side. Sharon was a vision in brown. Of all the girls, her parallels went closest to her ankles, which only went to prove that she was the nicest girl there. She had got her mother to flick her brown hair like Farrah Fawcett majors, especially for the occasion. She was lovely with her brown eyes and she was my angel. She let me hold her hand at the bus stop without so much as a, why is it bad we lad? My big brother was paying no attention to her thus far, and it seemed to me that Sharon was most interested in Eric Faulkner anyway. As for me, I was wearing my best 
green parallels from John Fraser's, with Macaulay tartan stripes fresh from Princess Street in Edinburgh, professionally sewn down the side on my mother's sewing machine. I was also wearing my best brown and cream striped tank top and my Harrington jacket. I splashed some extra brute all over it to mask any residual whiff of book from my traumatic trip to get my teeth out and tomato sauce from the Geordie Best sausages at the Jumble Sale. At last, the black taxi arrived at the bus stop and we all crammed inside. The smell of brute aftershave and Charlie perfume was overwhelming. Charlie was like brute for girls, except they didn't need to splash it all over. The black taxi driver was an Elvis fan with UVF tattoos and a beer belly. His glasses had a brown tint that went ever darker as the evening sun went out. And where are you going? he asked. We are going to see the Bay City Rollers at the Ulster Hall and I just love less, so I do, answered Lynn McQuiston, oblivious to the intended irony of the question. So I'll leave us there in the black taxi for a minute and just say hello to everyone who's uh, watching this evening. Hello, uh, Nigel uh, McCombs, regular Ali Bennett, and Kaya Evelyn Brown, Andy and Trainer, um, uh, Michael McKinley Sr. Good to have you along again, Michael. Good evening, Andrea Trainer. Um, uh, so Lucy, Zoe, Mark and Ali are all there watching this round a wee bonfire in your back garden. Sounds brilliant. <laughs> Very good. Hello, Danica. How are you? Lovely to have you along. Hope you're staying well. Um, hi, Ann Kirk. Uh, missed last night reading, but caught up this morning. Really enjoying it. Hope, hopefully you enjoy this one as well. Um, um, and hello, Brendan and Colm and Lauren. Hi, Joanne. Brian Smith and Ray Kirk. Hello, Marie and Yitzhak and the lovely Leslie from up the country who's downstairs. Hi Francis McGrath, hope you're well. Hiya Mark Burgess and Conor O'Neill. Hiya Damien Hall in Edinburgh and Oliver Core and uh, hi Christine Bunting, hope you're well. Um, glad you're enjoying it Danica and hello uh, Kelly Anderson who was a fantastic voice coach on the Paperboy musical. Um, okay so I'll just continue with the story of going to see the Bay City Rollers in concert in the Ulster Hall. Ten minutes and dozens of choruses of We Love You Rollers later, we were down the Shankle Road and in the town. Once we had emerged from the black taxi, my big brother expressed his disgust that the boys had been joining in the chants of We Love You Rollers. He gave us a brief lecture explaining that Boys should from refrain from singing along with anything they're referred to loving the rollers because loving other boys or everyone would think we were fucking fruits. And so henceforth we clapped or stamped our feet aggressively along to any mantras that use the word love in appreciation of our heroes. And we contented ourselves with shouting yo manfully every so often instead of joining in with the singing. As we arrived in Bedford Street, we were greeted by the queue outside of the Ulster Hall, a seething mass of tartan and parallels singing Woody, Eric, Alan, Leslie and Derek, we love you rollers, rollers we love you. I had never seen such a large crowd on a Belfast street without the presence of petrol bombs. I was so enthralled that I joined in with the singing immediately until my big brother kicked me in the shins and I remembered the love rule. The atmosphere was amazing. We were about to join the end of the longest queue I had ever seen when Lynn McQuiston reminded us of her plans to begin a relationship with Les McCune at the stage door. Like, I don't even know where the stage door is, said Heather. Why is it, Bob? said my big brother. Bollocks, said Philip Ferris. It was at this moment that my experience of the School of Music came in handy in a most unexpected way. I had played my violin in the back row of the second violins in the School of Music Orchestra concert in the Ulster Hall the previous year. It was such a big occasion that even Patrick Walsh had played in the orchestra that day, despite the fact that he generally said that the Ulster Hall was just Protestants. On the day itself, I had in fact nearly fallen off the stage when I dropped my chin rest and one leg of my chair teetered perilously over the edge of the podium towards an audience that was heavy with gold jewellery and whispered ings. 
Anyway, as a performing artiste, I had entered the Ulster Hall that day by the aforementioned stage door. So I knew exactly where the stage door was. It was in the next street at the back of the hall itself. Folly me, I said triumphantly, much to my big brother's disgust. For once I was the leader and he would have to follow. I led the gang down a side street of shops that were boarded up from the latest car bomb. In less than a minute, there we were, standing at the stage door at the rear of the Ulster Hall. Amazingly, there were hardly anyone else there, apart from a few other tartan-clad girls sobbing and screaming, and a couple of RUC men who were clearly more used to policing angry rioters than hysterical teenagers. They're already inside, so users may as well go back round and get into the queue, kids, said one of the RUC men with a moustache when he saw us. I turned round immediately to obediently return to our place in the queue. Hey, your horses, said my big brother. They're not here yet. I was shocked at this remark. It had never occurred to me that the RUC would tell lies. Like... The Peters wouldn't still be here if the rollers was already inside, said Heather excitedly. Oh my God, my Liz is going to be here right now any minute, shrieked Lynn. Bollocks, said Philip Ferris. No sooner had he yet again demonstrated just how limited his vocabulary was than a long black limousine with the windows blacked out like a police car pulled up in front of us. What happened next? was like a dream. It seemed to happen in slow motion, like the six million dollar man running. Right before our very eyes, five young men dressed in parallels and tartan emerged from the limousine in quick succession. Alan and Derek, the two brothers, got out first and escaped through the stage door before we had fully grasped the reality of what was happening in front of us. Eric Faulkner was next. Eric! screamed Irene Maxwell as she ran forward and grabbed his jacket. It was like a sick woman touching Jesus in a story in Sunday school. Eric turned briefly and smiled at her. His face was mirrored in the t-shirt Irene was wearing. She fainted as Titch McCracken and Sharon Burgess knelt down to see if she was all right and before we had a chance to take all of this in, the real live Liz McCune from off top of the pops was suddenly running straight past us. I love you, Liz, screamed Lynn McQuiston repeatedly, the tears streaming down her face onto her buck teeth as she reached out and grabbed at a tuft of hair on the back of his head. Liz just looked scared and kept running. While the girls in our gang had known instinctively how to approach this situation by screaming and attempting to touch their idols, the boys didn't know what to do. We didn't want to scream or touch our heroes, but we did want to make some more masculine kind of connection with them. So we did what came most naturally to us. We kicked them. My brother led the way and just managed to land a backside, leaving a dirty book print on the lead singer's white parallels. It was then that fate intervened, intervened once again in my favour. The last roller to get out of the car was Woody, and I found myself standing right beside him. So what did I do? Did I ask him for his autograph? No, he was moving much too fast for such niceties. Did I shout, we love you, Woody? Of course not. My big brother had forbidden such expressions. So I did what I knew best. I kicked him. In the heat of the moment, I abandoned my pacifist principles for the second time that day and expressed my adoration of a pop idol in the only way I knew how. I kicked him in the shins. Yes, I kicked Woody. Once the rollers were safely inside the Ulster Hall, we looked at each other in excited silence. We had seen all the rollers in real life. We had screamed at them, touched them and kicked them. 
As we rejoined the queue, we relived, relived those precious moments, something we would continue to do for the next six months afterwards. I touched Eric and he smiled at me and I fainted, said Irene. I'll never wash my hands again. I touched Les and he knows I love him and I think he loves me back, said Lynn sadly, looking down at awe at a clump of Les's hair still in her hand. I never wash my hand again. I kicked your man Les, boasted my big brother. That'll harden him. I kicked Woody. I rejoined Gitley. I never uh, wash my foot again. Titch McCracken looked up stubbed out his cigarette in the pavement and then followed it up by spitting contemptuously and rolling his eyes. My heart was now beating very quickly with the excitement of it all. For a second I wondered if God was going to let my bad heart kill me before the beginning of the show as a punishment for using violence on a pop star. But mercifully, mercifully he spared me and I got to see the whole concert in its full glory. So let me see who else is um, joining in, joining us this evening. Um, hello, Gillian Much and Ian Parsley. Hi, Ruth Blevins. Lovely to have you here. Hi, Andy McCauley and Dave Riddell and Fiona Hawkins and a BRA old girl, Michael Walker and uh, Quinton Oliver. Great to have you all uh, uh, listening in. Um, glad you're enjoying it, Kelly Anderson. And uh, yeah, so I'll keep going and tell you what happened next once we got into the actual show. It seemed like we had to wait forever for the concert to begin. The longer we waited, the more the tension grew and the more the screams intensified. I began to get fed up with all this stupid screaming and passed the time by counting the number of pipes on the big organ at the back of the stage. Inside the historic building, the chants of We Love You Rollers were deafening. I'd never heard so many girls screaming, even after a bomb and neither had the Ulster Hall, I'm sure. We made our way to our prime seats up in the balcony. Looking down on the stalls below, teeming with tartan teenagers, I felt slightly dizzy. It felt as if the whole crowd was about to explode, when suddenly the lights went out. At first, I thought the provos had blown up an electricity transformer again, but then I realised that this was what Miss Barron would have called dramatic effect. One minute there was complete darkness and the next there were five spotlights on five figures. I recognised them of course from Top of the Pops and also from up close at the stage door. The big were here now. They were live. The screaming reached an even higher pitch. It was so piercing that I had to put my hands over my ears. The concert began. I couldn't actually hear the rollers. What with all the screaming and with my ears covered? Heather, Irene, Lynn and even Sharon Burgess screamed and cried through the classic ballad, Give a Little Love. I put my arm around Sharon Burgess and she didn't tell me to wise up. But she wouldn't turn her lips towards me either because that would have meant taking her eyes off Eric Faulkner. Every so often, if the screens began to calm down, Les would turn his back to the audience and shake his bum. For some reason, this made the girls go wild, but every time he did it, I was sure I could see the bookmark from my big brother's Dr. Martins on the back side of Les's white parallels. Philip Ferris watched carefully through every guitar solo and kept accusing the rollers of miming. We all sang along, to, sang along to Summer Love Sensation and I noted that my big brother knew every word, even though he was supposed to be an Alice Cooper fan who hated teeny boppers. Meanwhile, Heather Mateer started to dance up too close to him, but he was playing it cool because he preferred girls who did gymnastics. I noticed with some relief that Heather's flirtations with my big brother did not appear to be upsetting Sharon Burgess. Woody didn't attempt, attempt to dance much, so I wasn't able to ascertain whether he had developed a limp due to my recent attack. So I reassured myself that, that I had done no lasting damage to his shins or his musical career. As the concert continued, the volume of the screaming and the pitch of the temperature in the Ulster Hall went ever upwards. 
The hall was full of the smell of the sweat and cigarettes and spearmint chewing gum of a thousand teenagers. There was a powerful crescendo of hormones, heat and noise. We were happy. We were alive. And for a few hours, we didn't think or care about homework or gunmen or bomb scares or there being no jobs. The Belfast crowd are the best audience in the world, proclaimed Les between hits, and we loved him even more. Of course, it couldn't last forever. And when at last it came to the final encore of Shang Alang, the whole of the Ulster Hall erupted into a new level of frenzy. Unfortunately, the crowds on the balcony surged forward so fast that the front panel of the balcony began to give way, as if it might fall on the fans below. There was serious danger that Rollers fans from above might rain down upon the unsuspecting crowd below in the stalls. Luckily, the security men, noticing the impending disaster, immediately sprang into action. With the assistance of several RUC men with moustaches, they dutifully spent the last verse of Shang Alang clinging onto the front panel of the balcony with all their might. When the concert finally ended and we began to leave the Ulster Hall in our droves, the security men stayed where they were, holding onto the front of the balcony to stop it collapsing onto the rows below. They were sweating more than us. Our gang had to walk home in the rain that night because there weren't enough black taxis for everyone. We had clearly overwhelmed the paramilitary public transport system. We didn't care though. We sang Shang Alang as we ran with the gang the whole way home up the shankle. When I finally got into my bed that night, I kept waking, trying to, mem trying to figure out what had been real and what had been a dream. The next day, at school, I swapped my usual grammar school scarf with a tartan scarf, even though this was against the rules and it clearly didn't go with my duffel coat. When I arrived in the playground that morning, I noticed Ian, formerly of the tits, standing against the wall, sullenly reading his new musical express. I couldn't resist deliberately walking past him, whistling Shine a Line loudly and flaunting my tartan scarf. Ian pretended not to hear or see me, but I knew I had provoked a response when he aggressively turned the pages of the status quo feature he was reading and spat on the ground disgustedly. At that moment, Miss Barron was walking past and told him off for spitting the playground. We are not hooligans at this school, she scolded. We are civilised here. Ian got to tension and stuck a kick me sign on the back of my blazer with chewing gum at lunchtime for revenge. I drifted through every class that day in a daze, retaining even less knowledge than usual, apart from in French when the teacher nipped me under the arm until I got my verbs right. Do you remember that, Fiona? <laughs> However, when I picked up my 48 Belfast telegraphs from Earl Max Van that night, I was shocked by the reports about the Bay City Rollers concerts on their pages. Old men were saying that the Rollers fans were uncivilised hooligans, even worse than spitting schoolboys. Instead of rave your views of the happiest night in Belfast for years, there were angry people claiming that teenagers at the pop music concert in the Ulster Hall the previous night had vandalised the balcony. There were allegations that the concert had turned into a riot that could have ended in tragedy. There were cross baldy men demanding that there should be no more pop concerts in the Ulster Hall ever again because we couldn't be trusted not to wreck it. This was unfair. We were being misrepresented. This was what John Hume called injustice. I delivered my papers reluctantly and angry that night. I felt like I was personally delivering untruths about myself to my own customers. It was the first time ever that I hated doing my papers. I began to wonder if there were other career opportunities I could pursue in the future. As I wandered home that night, humming Give a Little Love, I considered my potential for delivering milk or bread, neither of which could tell lies, or perhaps becoming an international spy like James Bond or 
An astronaut who got lost in an anomaly in time and space. I was growing up, so I was. So there you are, that's chapter 17, paper boy. And uh, just want to thank you all for joining me. Hope you enjoyed it. Nigel McCombs, McCombs says, fan flipping tastic. <laughs> that's great. Brilliant, so it is, says Evelyn Bryan. Glad you've enjoyed it, Evelyn. Hi, Nave. Uh, great to have you. Thank you for enjoying it so much. And uh, hello to the K, the K twins and Af Africa, I think from Uganda. Lovely to have you. Um, and uh, yes, Fiona, you remember it well. And uh, hello to Alan McLean and Mona Trainer as well. And hi, Lynn Hamilton, too. So thank you very much, everyone, for uh, listening to chapter 17 of Paperboy. We're going, to, we're going to be finishing the book actually by the end of this week because there are 20 chapters. So we're on to the last three now. Um, so thank you very much for uh, uh, joining me. And uh, I hope you stay home. Stay well and stay positive. Bye for now.